we'd like to welcome you to worship. If you're a first time guest, we are so honored that you chose to worship with us, and we pray that you would feel the love and grace of our community. If you have any questions or you need any assistance, please find one of our ushers. They'd be more than happy to help you. Now, I'd like to ask everyone, please take a moment and fill out the pew packet. And remember, please write clearly because, well, we'd like to be able to read it. And finally, if you would, take the next few moments to prepare your minds and prepare your hearts for worship. May you be blessed richly. Sisters in Christ, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God be with each and every one of you here this morning as we gather to worship the Lord, as we gather to hear his word spoken to us and to celebrate at this table. Again, we give a very warm welcome. I can't really improve on what Jimmy did in his message. His welcome to newcomers, if you're here for the first time, welcome either here or online. So we are so pleased to have you with us to worship today. We have several announcements I need to go through quickly. First of all, remember the attendance pads. I think that's all I need to say, right? Just remember the attendance pads. Uh, the Women of Hope are going to begin their new program year on September 20th. You can check the newsletter for a list of upcoming Women of Hope events. Also, next week is the primary election week, so make sure you find your polling station and get out to vote. And remember that we also are a polling station, so on... Tuesday, whenever it is that day, just know that there's going to be more traffic than usual. We have several deaths in the family to report. Uh, last week, we reported Joyce Brooks. Um, that service has been scheduled for Saturday, September 15th at 10 o'clock a.m. We also announced last week Fran Seidel, and the service is being planned for Tuesday, September 4th at 10.30 a.m. in the Hope Central Campus Chapel, which is right out there. Remember his sister-in-law, Linda, who is also a member. Also, Bob Walters died on August 8th. Please remember his wife, the Reverend Betty. A service was held for him on August 23rd. And then just a couple of days ago, Manny Knutson also passed away. He died on August 24th. And at this time, service information is incomplete, so stay tuned. And then also next week, we have polo shirts, new polo shirts, and these are the nice wicking material. I think we have six colors, right, Val? And they're going to be on sale next weekend, so uh, they're $20 each, correct? And they will be available next weekend. Also, Pastor Mark had a couple of other announcements that he wanted me to make. Uh, the first one is, you know we are going through a call process, correct? Seemed like we've been doing it for, what, 35 years now, but... Um, this week is the week that the candidate will be interviewed by the council. So please keep the council in your prayers as they discern God's will. Pray that the Spirit will be with them as they go through this process this week. 
And secondly, Pastor Mark also asked me to announce something about me. And that is this past weekend on Friday and Saturday, I attended the uh, parish deacon retreat. And I found on Saturday I was approved for commissioning as a parish deacon. So, thank you. Now, as you know, that's just the beginning of the process for me because what started out as being um, a desire to be a parish deacon has now become a desire to be a, a pastor. And I will be meeting with the Theological Review Panel on Thursday, September 6th. And that's where I'll find out the next steps and we'll report back to you what those are. So at this time, if you would please stand where you are and greet those around you in the peace of Christ. Let us worship the Lord. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the life beyond all death, the joy beyond all sorrow. Rejoicing in Christ's victory over sin and death, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbors. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. May Almighty God have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. 
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray together. Holy God, your word feeds our people with life that is eternal. Direct our choices and preserve us in your truth, that renouncing what is false and evil, we may live in you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
The lesson of the day is from the third chapter of Ruth, verses 1 to 18. One day, Ruth's mother, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Now Boaz, whose women you, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume, get dressed in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go, uncover his feet, and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am a guardian redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to do his duty as your guardian redeemer, good, let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized. And he said, no one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, bring me the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and placed the bundle on her. Then he went back to town. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, how did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, he gave me these six measures of barley, saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. The word of the Lord. Be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the seventh chapter. Ask, and it will be given to you. Saint, seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Seated and pray with me. O Lord, open my lips to proclaim your word. Open our ears to hear your word. Open our hearts to receive your word and open our arms and our hands to be your word to all that we meet this day. Amen. There was a little boy playing outdoors one day when he found a fascinating caterpillar, and he gently picked it up and took it home and asked his mom if he could keep it. And she said, of course, as long as you take good care of it. So the little boy got a large jar from his mother, put the caterpillar in it, put some plants in for food for the caterpillar, and even put a stick in so that the caterpillar could climb. Every day he watched the caterpillar with joy and gave it new plants to eat. Then one day, the caterpillar climbed up the stick and started acting strangely, and the boy was nervous 
thinking something was wrong, so he went and got his mother. She explained to him as simply as she could what metamorphosis was, how the caterpillar was going to encase itself in a cocoon, and eventually a beautiful, a beautiful butterfly was going to come out. Well, the little boy was thrilled with the thought that a butterfly was going to be created right there in his own jar. And sure enough, the caterpillar did enclose itself in a cocoon, and the boy patiently waited. And then it happened. One day, the boy could see a small hole in the cocoon, and he could see the butterfly struggling to come out. He was so excited, but before long, he grew impatient and thought it seemed like the butterfly really needed some help. And he had been taught by his parents to be helpful whenever he could, so he thought, maybe I can help now. So he ran to get some scissors, but he walked back because he learned that you never run with scissors in your hands. And he came and he cut a little hole in the cocoon, and sure enough, the butterfly fell out. But, but it didn't look right. It had a big, wet, swollen body and very small, shriveled wings. He kept waiting for the butterfly to dry out for its wings to expand, but neither ever happened. The butterfly spent the rest of its life crawling around with a swollen body and shriveled wings. It never was able to fly, and the boy was sad. His heartbroken mother found a local expert who helped her understand that the butterfly is supposed to struggle to get out because it's the struggle that strengthens the butterfly's wings so that it can fly. The boy's impatient, although good intentions, actually hurt the butterfly. Well, if what people tell me is true, then most of us say the one thing we need to work on is patience. You know, Lord, help me be patient right now, if you wouldn't mind. A couple of weeks ago, Pastor Mark stood right here at the same service and, and spoke wonderfully about patience, or really the lack of patience, and he had a great illustration, if you will remember, about how he decides what lane to pick when he pulls up to a red light. And it was a combination of the number of cars in each lane combined with the type of cars, of the sports car versus a semi, bless you, and then could it also be the type of driver? And so I laughed along with the rest of you, and I thought, you know, I can see myself in that story. I really need to work on my patience. But then I had to leave this service and get over to Lake Weir for anointing. And before long, I was so impatient on, you know, 27, 441, those lights are not timed. As soon as one turns green, the next one turns red. And then all the slow traffic was in the fast lane, and I was just seething. And then I remembered the sermon that I had just heard. And somewhat ashamed, I thought, I really do need to work on my impatience. Or another thing for me is coming to the checkout lane at the grocery, and there's three people in my line and two in the line next to me, so I move over to that line, only to find that one of them needs a price check and the other one has a million coupons, and then I'm upset about that. Well, I'm not really going to talk about patience today because that's what Pastor Mark did two weeks ago, but I'm going to talk about an added bonus that comes from being impatient, and that is the tendency to rush things or to get ahead of ourselves. Like the boy in our story, even with good intentions, we often tend to rush things because we can't wait. Sometimes all the necessary steps to get something accomplished just seems so time-consuming. So we think we know what we're going to do, and we just plunge right in, and we get ahead of ourselves in the process. So let's say that we're having... a uh, party, a dinner party for important guests, and we want to impress them by baking a cake from scratch, even though we've never done it before. Well, we live in a day and age when you can do a Google search and find recipes and ingredients, and rather than practicing, you watch a couple of YouTube videos, and you think, well, I know what I'm doing. So you wait till the day of, and then you start baking it, and then you get a little nervous, so then you start opening the oven door many times, which if you know anything about baking is not good for it. And so when the cake falls flat as a pancake, then there you are at the last minute, trying to come up with plan B. We get ahead of ourselves. Or maybe we're packing for a trip, say for an important meeting or for a social gathering, or for me, just packing my gym bag to take a shower and change after working out at the gym. Now, some people are meticulous in their packing. They make lists, and they start well in advance, and they know exactly what's going to go in there. But for some of us, especially if it's something we do quite often, we think, I know what I need, and we quickly throw things together, and we get there only to find out we forgot to pack our underwear, or for me, it's usually my belt that I forget. This time, it's not getting ahead of ourselves, but it's rushing things. Even when it comes to God, we pray for God's guidance, and we try to wait patiently for that guidance. 
But sometimes it just seems like God's taking too long to respond. And we just have to move on our own. I mean, sometimes God's answers come so slowly. Maybe if we just nudge ahead and let God catch up to us. Well, we've already seen in the book of Ruth that Naomi believes that all the things that have happened to her, good and bad, are because of God. Now that her daughter-in-law, Ruth, has met Boaz, she really believes that it would be God's will to bring them together, if for no other reason than to ensure her security and her daughter-in-law, Ruth's security. But rather than waiting for God, Naomi takes matters in her own hands. But before we talk about today's third chapter, let's briefly review the first two chapters for anyone who wasn't here or may have forgotten. If you remember back in the very beginning, we have this Israelite woman, Naomi, her husband, and two sons who leave Israel. They actually leave Judah, which is the southern part of Israel, because there's a famine. They go to a neighboring foreign country, Moab, because there's food there. Both of Naomi's sons marry, but that's about it on the good news front, because by verse 6 of chapter 1, Naomi's husband and both of her sons have died, leaving her with her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth. Well, then Naomi hears on the grapevine that God has provided food back in her homeland, so she decides, despite her miserable state, to head back home. And she tries to convince Orpah and Ruth that she has nothing to give them. They might as well stay in their homeland rather than go with her. Orpah listens and stays, but Naomi vows to stay with Naomi to death and beyond. And then last week in chapter 2, it began with the two women back in Judah. And sure enough, God had provided food. But interestingly enough, it was not like manna in the desert as it had been back in Exodus. No, this time you couldn't just walk out your door and get it. Ruth, like other poor people, had to go to the fields and glean them, glean for leftovers for food for her and Naomi. Well, as luck would have it, as I talked about last week and Pastor Mark did in the first chapter, it's not really luck, because the storyteller knows that it's the quiet, guiding hand of God at work. Not like a major actor in the story with a major speaking part, but rather more like a director behind the curtains who's guiding the action. So, as luck would have it, which we know is not really luck, as luck would have it, Ruth happens upon the field of Boaz, who's a wealthy relative of her father-in-law. And furthermore, as luck would have it, Boaz just happens to come to the field when she's there sees her, gives her enough food to take home for both her and Naomi. Again, is that chance or the gentle guidance of God? Well, Naomi sees a golden opportunity here. Now, the food that she gets and continues to get, even today, is great as long as the growing season is there. But what about the winter? What's going to happen in the winter when nothing is growing? So she needs to do something. If she could bring them together in marriage, then she could secure her year-round security for both her and Naomi. So chapter 3 begins. We know that there's going to be a relationship between Ruth and Boaz, and we see it developing, but we're wondering who's going to move the plot forward. Well, maybe it comes from being a good Jewish mother, or maybe any mother would want their daughter to be happy. And remember, Naomi looks at Ruth as her own daughter, but she decides that she needs to take action. Rather than pray for God's guidance or waiting for God, she decides on a plan of action. This is really kind of interesting since Naomi is the one character in the story who has seen God at work throughout her life, first in her misery and then bringing her blessing, but she feels that she must act, so she cooks up a plan. Now, if you were listening carefully to that plan, then you know that that plan sounds like more like the plot of a cheap romance novel than it does the divine word of God, but it is the divine word of God, and here it is. Naomi tells Ruth to bathe to put on her finest clothes and perfume, then go visit Boaz on the threshing floor after he has eaten and had plenty to drink and fallen asleep. Well, it, it gets worse. She's supposed to sneak in after dark. She's supposed to uncover Boaz's feet. And there are some commentators who quabble about what is meant by feet. But regardless of that, she is to lie down next to Boaz and wait. So what do you think Naomi thought was going to happen? It doesn't take much imagination to think that maybe Naomi was hoping that Boaz was going to do something that would force him to have to marry her daughter-in-law. And even a forced marriage would mean Naomi would get what she wanted, a new husband and a new home. Oh, by the way, Ruth was also to propose to Boaz after he woke up or whatever happened. But you know what Naomi wanted was good. 
She wanted Ruth to be happy, and she wanted Ruth and Boaz to be together. But she wanted it on her own terms. She couldn't patiently wait for God or for Boaz to act. She needed to rush things along a bit. And before we judge her, we need to recognize that Naomi is really no different than we are. When we're really desperate, we like to think we pray to God and can wait patiently, but it's so much easier to cut corners, to get ahead of ourselves and God, and to rush things. But you know one of the most beautiful things about the story of Ruth are the twists and the turns throughout the story. God remains active behind the scenes, and ultimately God's will prevails. And it happens on God's terms, not on Naomi's, and on our own stories, not on our terms, but on God's. Remember Pastor Mark's homework to you two weeks ago, and I gave it to you again last week, and that was to listen to the story and see if we could see where God is acting. So let's pick up the action with Boaz waking up. He's probably still a little bit inebriated when he feels something at his feet. He wakes up to find out it's not something, but someone, and that someone was Ruth the woman he was clearly smitten with in chapter 2. And here she is in his bed throwing herself at him and proposing marriage. How would we expect him to react? How would we react if we were in the same situation? Certainly, the original hearer of the story was probably expecting a pretty steamy love scene to take place. Well, what happens, though, is shocking. Not only does Boaz not take advantage of the situation or Ruth, but he actually calls down God's blessings on Ruth for everything that she has done for her mother-in-law, Naomi, and he calls down further blessings on her that she wants him to be her husband. And he says, you know, there's someone else, though, who's first in line, and he's younger than I am, and he's better looking, and you might really want him. What an honorable man he was. Wow, talk about a turn in the storyline. So totally unexpected. Boaz thought that Ruth was noble in character, and he treated her that way. So wonderful and so unexpected in the story. He even told her to wait until early morning to leave so that nobody would get the wrong idea. Boaz takes on the role of what the law in Leviticus calls the kinsman redeemer. In our reading today, it used the term guardian redeemer. This was an honorable role where a family member could help out a less fortunate family member by redeeming their land and thus keeping the family name in Israel. But if Boaz had acted rashly and slept with Ruth, he could have married her, yes, but he would have forfeited the honored role of kinsman redeemer. We'll see next week in chapter 4 that the story does have a happy ending. Next week I'm actually calling it a beyond happily ever after, despite Naomi's plans that could have wrecked everything. Sometimes our reckless plans, our tendency to rush and get in the way of God has disastrous effects. But you know, sometimes like it was with Naomi and Ruth, somehow God finds a way to act despite our ill-conceived notions and helps guide things to the conclusion that God desires. Ultimately, the message for us in this powerful third chapter of Ruth is for us to look at our own kinsman redeemer. In case you missed it, Boaz, Naomi and Ruth's kinsman redeemer, foreshadows our own great redeemer. But our redeemer has a capital R, Jesus Christ. Like Naomi and Ruth, we find ourselves like vulnerable children who are in great need, but so often we're looking to fulfill our needs in all of the wrong places. If you have an image of Jesus in your mind as you listen to Boaz's words or rehear his actions, then you can see that he is kind of a foreshadowing of Jesus. Just as Boaz was a redeemer for Ruth, Christ is the redeemer for us, who saves us and brings us back from our own impatient, pushy actions to life in the kingdom of love. If you've seen the great Broadway play Les Miserables, then you're familiar with the scene of the character Jean Valjean, who has just been released from years of hard labor in prison. He's trying to find someone to take him in. He's a miserable person, and every door he goes to, they turn him away until he happens upon the door of the bishop. And the bishop not only takes him in, but he feeds him and allows him to stay there for the night. Watch what happens next. On a cold, bleak night, long ago, a beggar wandered the streets looking for a warm place to rest his head. So 
silver candlesticks and offered them to the king. Now John was taken aback by the man's mercy. Man called him in, unshackled him. You may be on your way. Once the gendarme had left, the bishop told the thief, with this silver, I have ransomed your soul for Christ. Go now, redeem and restore and live a life worthy If Naomi's plan had worked, she would have the husband in the family she wanted, but that's all. Thanks be to God, Boaz acted according to the will of God, and Naomi not only gets the husband that she wants, but she gets the redeemer that she needs. We hatch our own plans, but on our own we're no better off than Jean Valjean, convicted sinners who deserve nothing. But God's great love for us has redeemed us, not by offering silver candlesticks, but by offering the life of Jesus, his son, on the cross. Sisters and brothers, slow down. Let's take our time, for we have never been offered such grace. So let's let our Redeemer bring a beyond happily ever after to our story. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. God of life, we praise you for your abiding presence from generation to generation, blessing your people, strengthening us, strengthening us to lives of service, empowering us to witness. Hear the prayers we offer on behalf of your creation. Holy Father, who calls us child, be present in this place of worship as we come here as your people, your children. Open our ears to the songs we sing, the words being spoken, and that still, small voice from the Holy Spirit who is whispering to us. Give us servant hearts as we go from this place, creating safe spaces of refuge for those who especially need to hear the good news of your love. Lord, in your mercy. God, our Redeemer, in sustaining the lives of Naomi and Ruth, you gave new life to your people. We ask that from age to age, new generations may be born to restore life and nourish the weak by returning to you those things we once thought ours. Give us patience to listen to you call us. And when we hear your voice, give us courage to follow you. Lord, in your mercy. God of widows and strangers, you protect the oppressed and forgotten and feed the hungry with good things. You stand among us in Christ, offering life to all. Give us open hearts and minds to respond with love to the world, caring for those whom you care for. And now, O oh God, we want to bring to you those that we love and who have asked us to pray for them now on our, in our hearts or on our lips. Lord, in your mercy. Father God, thank you for the saints that have gone before us, teaching us these sacred stories. Surround us with a cloud of witnesses and sustain us by your powerful word that in the night of loneliness and fear, we, being weary, may not lose heart, but push toward the joy that is to come. Lord, in your mercy. God, walk with us through whatever valleys we find ourselves navigating. Take us by the hand and lead us toward each new day with the hope that is ours. In the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Please be seated.
to be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captive, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering and death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. In the night in which he is betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So as we remember the gift that he has given to us, his body broken for us, his blood poured out for us, the redemption that he has bestowed upon us, we come to into his presence to receive his gift. Please join hands as a community. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. the gift of God for the people of God. The disciples knew the Lord Jesus in the breaking of bread. Come to this table where you are known and loved. Please be seated.
stand as you're able. May the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, keep you as you grow in God's grace now and forever. Amen. Loving God, by your Spirit we are born anew, and you nourish us like newborns with this holy food by which we grow into salvation. Give us grace to live as your risen daughters and sons, shining in the world with your marvelous light until you gather all creation to your heavenly table where Christ reigns in glory forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Go in peace, share the good news.
one is Eddie? Which one is Eddie? Which puppet? Yeah, it works. 